you would open your Bibles to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. In Acts 8, we want to read verses 30 down to 38. Acts 8, 30 through 38, where Philip the Evangelist has been sent to the Ethiopian who's riding along, returning from having worshipped at Jerusalem. It says in Acts 8, verse 30, So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation his justice was taken away, and who will declare his generation, for his life is taken from the earth? So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture preached Jesus to him. Now as they went down the road they came to some water and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and he baptized him. As we read here, the Ethiopian is going along and he's reading from the Word of God. He's contemplating what he's reading. He doesn't quite understand that. And so when Philip comes up alongside him and asks him, do you understand what you're reading? He says, I need help to be able to understand this. And we understand why that is because that was the Old Testament. It was a prophecy and those things that were prophesied in the Old Testament, of course, weren't fulfilled in the New. So men of the Old Testament times, they would read those things and try to figure out where they applied, when they were fulfilled, how they were fulfilled. And so the eunuch is doing that as he's riding along and thinking about that. But then when Philip comes up along beside him and then joins him in that chariot, it says he begins at that same scripture and preached Jesus to him. So... He revealed the truth, the true meaning, the true understanding of that passage in Isaiah. And he taught him about the Lord and about redemption in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when he learned that truth, the eunuch asked there, what hinders me from having that salvation? What hinders me from baptism? You know, why is it that when he came to that water that he cared about baptism and he cared about what hindered him from being baptized? Why did that matter to him? Why did it arrest his attention and become a pressing matter during his travel and his study time with his evangelists? Why, why did he stop essentially in his thoughts as he's contemplating these great things and understanding about Jesus, the fulfillment of the prophecy, why did he say, what hinders me from being baptized? Well, we understand Luke already answered the point of the purpose of baptism back in <coughs> Acts chapter 2, verse 38, where he records Peter's words. When Peter told the people on Pentecost, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. See, the eunuch understood that baptism would take his sins away. That he would be redeemed, that he would be forgiven. And because he wanted to be forgiven, he's now asking, what's stopping me from that? What's stopping me from receiving the forgiveness of my sins from God? So what hinders me? Well, as we think about this, the only hindrance on his part was simply a confession that he believed that Jesus is the Son of God. When he confessed that, they both went down into the water, he was baptized, 
And his verse 39 says, he went on his way rejoicing because he understood he had been forgiven of his sins, that that hindrance had been removed. Now there are various types of issues that stand in the way of people being forgiven of their sins or having fellowship with God. There are things that we might call roadblocks. Here he calls it a hindrance. Sometimes there are things that are simple, like the Ethiopian. Just Philip said, if you confess, you can be baptized. At other times, there are things that are difficult. And where that difficulty lies is the idea of repenting, of changing, of making a sacrifice in your life. And so that's hard for some people to do in that sense. But there are things at times that are external to us. There are some things that are internal. There are influences around us or it's a matter of our heart that stand between us and having fellowship with God. But whatever the hindrance is, wherever it comes from, whatever its nature, it has to be overcome in order for us to have the hope of everlasting life. For us to be right with God and to look forward to a home in heaven, whatever there is standing between us and God needs to be removed, needs to be taken out of the way, it needs to be addressed in one form or another. And so in this lesson, we're going to look at two hindrances to salvation. Lord willing, we're going to look at two more next week. But in this lesson, we want to notice two hindrances to salvation. The first being in Acts chapter 13, false teachers. In Acts chapter 13, these things equally apply to children of God as they do to those who are not children of God. In Acts 13 and verse 6 beginning, it says, Now when they had gone through the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elamus the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, O full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. It says here that Elamus the sorcerer, who's described as a false prophet, in verse 8, sought to turn the proconsul away from the faith. The faith is simply another way of saying the truth, the gospel, the message of redemption, how men are justified before God. Remember in John chapter 8, verse 32, the Lord had said there that you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. See, the truth or the faith the gospel is what leads men to being free from sin. Paul and Barnabas in Acts 13 are there to teach people about that freedom that comes through the truth, described as the faith. And so the faith saves the soul. The faith, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 10 to 11 talk about, is according to sound doctrine. So this sound doctrine, the faith, the truth that's being taught here, the proconsul is opposing it. He opposes that truth. Whatever it was that he had over that proconsul as far as their relationship and what he was teaching him, what he was maybe telling him as prophecies that of course were false or the doctrine that he was feeding to him that was not according to the truth, he wanted to keep that man in that error. And so he sought to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Down in Acts 13, verse 45, Acts 13, verse 45, this is later when Paul and Barnabas are at Antioch. It says, But when the Jews saw the multitudes, 
They were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming, they opposed the things spoken by Paul. They opposed that truth. False teachers oppose truth and false teaching obviously opposes truth. Now this might come in the form today by a Baptist preacher preaching on the radio. And he's preaching saved by faith alone. Or he's preaching once saved, always saved. Or he tells people you inherited Adam's sin and therefore you were born a sinner separate from God. And so there is false teaching out there and false teachers today that oppose the truth. It might be the Pentecostal who preaches from the pulpit that today we have these miraculous spiritual gifts and we can go around and we can do things like they did in the Bible. We can heal the sick. We can make the blind see. We can cause the lame to walk. Or we can raise the dead. Yes, I've talked to people who actually believe the dead are being raised today. But the Bible clearly teaches the age of miracles is over. It's done. Its purpose, its point of revealing and confirming the truth has been served. We have that truth. Miracles are no longer in effect today. But there are people who will teach it and deceive people into thinking that miracles are being done. Televangelists are famous for doing that and getting the crowd whipped up and excited about some outpouring of the Spirit. But it's false. It's error. It could be a brother in Christ writing a book or even preaching error, sin, unrighteousness, denying the existence of hell, or saying that the judgment was in AD 70. <coughs> so it's not like people of the world are the only ones who oppose the truth, but there are brethren who oppose the truth. And what that does is it hinders people from salvation. It hinders people either from becoming a child of God and having their sins forgiven, or as a child of God, leading them away, separating them from the Lord, causing them to live in error. False teachers and false teaching oppose the truth. It is a hindrance to salvation. Sometimes what they want to do, though, is not outright oppose the truth, that is, contradict it with another doctrine, another idea, but they simply want to silence the truth. If you notice in Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 4, and beginning here in verse 15, remember that the apostles, Peter and John, the others, had been arrested by the council in Jerusalem, and the council has discussed what do we do with these men. In Acts chapter 4, verse 15 beginning, it says, But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they confessed, or conferred rather, among themselves, saying, What shall we do with these men? For indeed that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. Well, if they are not teaching in the name of Jesus, people are not hearing the message of salvation, and therefore that's hindering them from having their sins forgiven. So false teachers, false teaching, sometimes what they want to do is silence the truth. Don't speak that truth. Many years ago when I preached in Mineola, Texas, the congregation had a newspaper article. And I'd written an article about the error of the Methodist church and the foundation of their authority, scripture, tradition, experience, and I forget the the fourth one, I think there's a fourth one there. Somebody will remind me. But I wrote about that. So I hit hard on that. Well, the local Methodist church who had a lot of influence in that town put pressure on the newspaper publisher. Don't let them put any more articles in the paper. Well, to that publisher's credit, he didn't give in to that pressure. That was noble of him to do. 
But when I preached in Louisville, Kentucky, and we put something in the local county section of the main Courier Journal, I sent in an article, submitted one, on homosexuality. And they came back and said, we're not going to allow you to run that. So then I put in, just quoting scripture, condemning homosexuality, submitted that. They said, we're not going to run it, and we're not going to allow you to run any more articles ever again. Because it was a lesbian editor in that section of the paper. So they silenced that truth. It's not necessarily that they opposed it. Yes, they did, but it's not like they were putting, hey, everybody who reads this paper needs to be a homosexual. That, that wasn't what they were doing. But what they did is, we're not going to let you tell people that it is a sin. Sometimes these days, we see such silencing taking place in companies where people work, or at school, and we certainly see it on social media. There are certain things that they just don't want said. False teachers oppose the truth. That causes a problem when they silence that truth. It hinders people from being saved. We have to be careful about that. You know, sometimes they want to corrupt the truth, confuse the truth. You go to Acts chapter 16, Acts 16, verse 16, beginning here. Acts 16, verse 16, it says, Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed, possessed with a spirit of divination met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God and proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days, but Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. One of the things that's happening here is Satan wants to confuse people about who it is that is teaching truth. And with her coming along with the spirit of divination and essentially endorsing Paul and Barnabas, without that being rebutted, as she continues to follow them, continues to do that, people will eventually associate the two together and think, well, she endorses them by default. Well, do they endorse her? And so it's confusing the truth with error. Today, we see this sometimes in what's called a ministerial alliance. Not sure how many people know about this, but usually in communities and areas, towns, counties sometimes, there will be what's called a ministerial alliance. They want all the preachers of the church to be a part of this alliance and they come together, they get involved in different kinds of works, different kinds of quote, ministries and things like that. But what it does is it blends everybody into one big group and it's ecumenical, like everybody approves of everybody else. Everybody's okay with everybody else. Sometimes this comes about with what we might call prayer meetings. You know, things like gather around the pole and pray, and they want to get people in there, and very often there is false doctrine that is taught in those settings. They want people to come together and join with each other. Sometimes, you know, people come by here and drop a flyer, hey, come and participate in our event. Well, we can't do that. We can't have fellowship with you. We're, we're, we do not agree with your doctrine, your practices. So we cannot get involved in things like that. Sometimes it is that liberal brethren want us to have unity with them. But the unity they want is us to approve of what they do. That's the unity. That, instead of giving up their practices that are not authorized in the Word of God, they want us just to turn a blind eye and not say anything about what they're doing that is unscriptural. We can't do that. That corrupts the truth. That, that clouds the message of God's Word. And so we cannot be involved in that, but false teachers want that. You know, whenever one is influenced by false teachers and their teaching, whether to oppose the truth, whether to silence that truth so people don't hear it, or to corrupt that truth, 
it leads to the exact same thing. And that is damnation instead of salvation. We need to resist false teachers and the error that they promote. In Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11, remember the apostle writes this, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. We need to expose that error, show it for what it truly is, and condemn that error that's being taught. In Acts chapter 4, remember what we read there, and they were trying to silence Paul and John, or rather Peter and John, the other apostles. Remember in Acts 4 verse 19, but Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. When people try to silence us, we need to have that bold reaction. Whether that's at work, at school, in the community, wherever it may be, we need to have that bold reaction. We are not going to be silent. We're going to speak the truth. We're going to expose error. We're going to oppose that error. We will condemn it because it is a hindrance to salvation. Another hindrance that people sometimes have experience is the hardening of their hearts. In Acts chapter 7, Acts chapter 7, beginning in verse 51, let's read down through verse 60. This is the occasion where Stephen is preaching to the council at Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 7, verse 51, he comes down to the point of the matter. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hardened ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their coats or their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. You see how Stephen is preaching to them? And he's trying to get them to see how that they are resisting God. They're resisting the Holy Spirit that these men are deluded into thinking they're serving God and following God's will and persecuting Christians and suppressing the gospel as much as they can. And he is telling them you are exactly the opposite. You're standing against God and you stand condemned before it. And because their hearts were hardened, or as he puts it here, you stiff neck and uncircumcised and hearted ears, they won't tolerate his teaching and they decide that they are going to kill him. And they are whipped up into a frenzy. They drag him out of town. They stone him. And murder Stephen on that occasion. Because of a hardened heart. You see how a hardened heart hinders salvation? You know, that's true when you think about people being taught the gospel that if their heart is not tender, they're not going to receive that truth. Some people do have a tender heart when they first hear the gospel. In Acts chapter 8, where we began with the Ethiopian, when he heard that gospel, he, he was open, he was receptive. His, his heart was tender to it. When Simon the sorcerer in Acts chapter 8 was confronted with his sin, remember he had become a Christian, and then he tried to buy the power to bestow spiritual gifts and Peter condemned him in Acts 8 
telling him that his heart was not right in the sight of God. What did Simon do on that occasion? He said, verse 24, Pray to the Lord for me that none of the things which you have spoken may come upon me. He was wrong. He was in sin. But he had a tender heart. When he was rebuked for it, he turned back. He did not have a hardened heart. You know, some people have hardened hearts that hold them back from salvation because of pride or stubbornness like the Jews standing before Stephen. In John chapter 9, John chapter 9, let's turn and look there real quick. John 9. In John chapter 9, you have an occasion where there is a blind man that's been healed and the Jews are angry and upset about this. And so they call that man's parents before themselves, before them, and ask, is this your son? You know, was he born blind? Yes, yes, yes. How was he made to see? Don't know. They call the man who had been healed back in before them, and they keep pressing him to try to deny that Jesus really is the Christ or has fellowship with God. Well, John chapter 9 then, in verse 33, as this man is basically taking them to school on what they should believe, you know, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Verse 34, they answered and said to him, you were completely born in sins and are you teaching us? See, they were so arrogant to think we know the gospel. We know the law. We know how God works in this world. And you don't know anything. You're teaching us. They were arrogant, just like the council was arrogant when Stephen preached to them. You know, today we run into this when you have a denominational preacher who's a, quote, seminary graduate. I, I couldn't tell you how many times... You know, I've talked to people and, you know, I'm a preacher. Well, what seminary did you go to? Well, I didn't. You didn't? No? I studied the Bible and I preach. <laughs> Boy, they don't get that. And most of that denominational world has zero respect for someone who studies the Word of God and teaches it. They think you have to have initials following after your name. You have to have had some sort of education. And many of them, of course, require it for, quote, ordination in their particular system. Sometimes it is that our parents can be arrogant. Well, you're my child. What do you mean you're teaching me? I know there are some of us here who have run into that. Learn the truth. You go back. You talk to your parents. Your parents just completely dismiss you. Because they're your parents. You can't tell me. Instead of being humble and listening to the truth. Sometimes it is it's older brethren who will not heed an admonition or a rebuke. Because they're full of pride. They're puffed up. They think, well I've studied this for as long as you've been alive. You can't tell me anything. Sometimes it's because of prejudice. There's pride, there's prejudice in some people. In Acts chapter 17, there's a great example of this as Paul is at Athens and he's preaching to the people there who, of course, pagan idolaters. But in Acts chapter 17, if you notice verse 30, it says, Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because He has appointed a day on which He will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom He has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising Him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. While others said, we will hear you again on this matter. See, some of those pagans, when they heard about resurrection from the dead, they mocked because they had a prejudiced view. They had a preconceived understanding about things and they were not going to have it. They were thinking, Paul, you're foolish, you're out of your mind, you don't know what you're talking about. That is utterly ridiculous for you to talk about resurrection from the dead. It's because of what they had been trained in and been taught in 
throughout their lives. You know, the cross of Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 tells us, that the preaching of the cross was foolishness to some. Foolishness. The Jews looked at the cross of Christ and they thought, how could a Savior be one who is executed like a common criminal? How could that be? So people have a prejudiced mind. You know, when we talk to people, sometimes we tell them about there's one true church and how they react to that. They mock it. In fact, I don't know if you follow our Facebook page or not, but putting out some material there, there are people who just absolutely come unglued. When you point out, look, the Scriptures teach there's only one church, that denominations are sinful, they're a product of men. They do not like to hear that. And they will push back on it and fight back on it and be rather terse, which is fine. You know, people, if they want to take their best shot, fine. I don't mind that. You want to criticize, you want to tell me I'm wrong, fine. But put the Scripture there. They're prejudiced, though. They won't even consider the idea that's being presented, the Scriptures that are put before them to think about that. You know, sometimes you talk to someone about baptism, and they'll say, well, you're trying to earn your salvation. See, they've been taught. Their mind has been pre-programmed how to view that. And you could sit down with them and say, look, Mark 16, 16 says to be baptized. Matthew 28, 19, 20 says to be baptized. Acts 2, 38. Acts 22, 16. And you keep going down the line. Look at all these passages, passages that say baptism is for salvation. It's a work. You don't have to be saved. And you wonder, well, how... How could they look at that and still have this conclusion? Well, it's prejudice. They have a preconceived idea that they're not letting go of. And that's a hardened heart. That prejudice hardens that heart. I'm not going to receive the truth. I have known a brethren who've talked to someone and they, they just show them and have that person read. The person reading, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, who does not believe will be condemned. Mark 16, 16. And their response, well, that's your interpretation. What is that? That's a hardened heart because of prejudice. Because of that preconceived idea. Sometimes it is, you know, Church of Christ people, they're legalists, bigots, and we don't have to listen to them. But it's a hindrance to salvation. If you and I have prejudice, we're not willing to consider, to look at, to heed what's written in the Word of God, we're no better off than them. Whatever the issue, whatever the topic may be, whether it's assembling with the saints, whether it's the way we dress, or the way we speak, if we're not going to listen because i got my mind made up. We're no better than them. What about the lust? Let's go to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 6 and 7, it says, For if this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's a hindrance to salvation. They're not able to come to it because it says they're specifically of various lusts that they have. You know, sometimes it's people lust alcohol. They lust that intoxication. They, they like the way it makes them feel. And they, you know, there will be people who will make the argument, well, I'm not getting drunk. I'm just drinking a little bit. You know, having a, a drink here and there. And that's what they want. And so they've made up their mind. That's what they want to have, even though the Scriptures condemn being intoxicated. It tells us to be sober, stay away from those things but yet they want to hold on to it. So they don't obey. They don't submit to the will of God. Sometimes it's pornography or fornication, sexual immorality. They don't want to give that up out of their life. They'd rather hold on to that and have that and say, well, it's not a big deal. It's okay. God allows it. Some people will rationalize in their mind, well, as long as it's not intercourse, just right up 
to the edge there. And they'll say, well, it's okay. There are Christians who believe that. Well, that falls under that category of lust. The uncleanness, the lewdness, it falls under that category. And so let's understand that these things hinder people from being saved. It might be greediness, materialism. They want things in this life. They're caught up in following celebrities and the way celebrities live and all the things they have or maybe just looking at their neighbors. Well, i got to have more. It validates me as a person. It makes me feel better. It shows people I'm successful in this world. And so they pursue material things or greedy. Well, that's part of that lust, part of that desire, that passion that they have for the things of this world. And that's a hindrance to their salvation because whether a person's heart is hardened by pride or prejudice or lust, there's only one outcome of that. And that's damnation and not salvation. We need to humble our hearts before God. In James chapter 4, James 4 verses 6 through 10 here, let's notice this, James 4 verse 6. But He gives more grace. Therefore, He says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. We have to set aside our own self-importance. We have to set aside our preconceived ideas. Fairly, openly, honest, consider the truth as the Bereans did. And they searched the Scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. And as Colossians chapter 3 talks about, that we have to put to death the deeds of the flesh. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, it says, Therefore put to death your members which are on earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. Let's put those things to death. Humble your heart. Don't hold on to those things that harden your heart to the truth that would cause you to reject that truth. We need to be in a position that we're ready to receive the truth, whatever that may be. No matter how we have lived before, what we have known, what we've understood, how we have practiced, how our ancestors have practiced and lived and done anything, it doesn't matter. If we want salvation, we need to remove all those hindrances, which includes the fact that we need to humble our hearts. If you would, open up to the invitation song number 834. 834. All hindrances have to be removed because our eternal soul is at stake. The Ethiopian in Acts chapter 8 realized this and as soon as he learned what stood in his way, as soon as he got the answer to what hinders me, he took action. He freely, readily, quickly confessed Jesus was the Christ because that what was standing before between him and having his sins forgiven. And we need to be the same way, have that same attitude. As soon as we understand well, maybe sooner than we understand. Let's back up one. Ask that question, what hinders me? Is there something hindering you? And as soon as we find out what that is that's hindering us, whether it is false teaching that has caused us to turn our hearts and minds away, or it is a hardened heart, we need to get rid of that, remove it, whatever it may be. Put that out of the way so that you can be saved. 
If you're here and you're a child of God, and you recognize, you know what, there's something in my life right now that's hindering me from having fellowship with God. I've gone into sin. I've entered into sin. I've allowed that into my life. Then won't you repudiate that sin, repent of it, put it out of your life, and seek God's mercy and forgiveness because He will give it to you. The sin is a hindrance to your salvation. If you've never obeyed the gospel, then won't you remove that hindrance today? You can believe Jesus is the Christ, confess Him before this audience, repent of your sins, and be baptized to have your sins washed away. You can do exactly what the eunuch did. And you can go on your way today rejoicing, knowing that you have been forgiven and you have the hope of heaven. You need to respond. Come now while we stand and sing. <laughs>